for North America, there were five major migrations of peoples who are now known as the Native Americans, Amerindians, uh, Native Americans, or just Indians, if you want to call them that. Uh, out of those, only three of those groups will really concern us today. The first two are the Northern Amerindians, the NNAs, the Southern Amerindians, which are the SNAs, and the Ancient Beringians. Now, uh, the first two of these groups, the SNAs and the NNAs, both crossed over from Siberia into America when the Bering Strait was actually closed off um, you know, in a land called Beringia, and they just walked across. And uh, these uh, two groups, they overwhelmingly comprised the ancestry of Amerindian peoples, um, you know, outside of the very far north. Uh, another group, the ancient Beringians, um, they came over several thousand years later. Uh, they were you know, before the uh, Bering Strait kind of drowned and, you know, became a strait uh, back, you know, Did. And, um, you know, eventually they penetrated into Alaska um, and they were either overrun or adopted the culture of some of their neighbors um, down to the south, the uh, northern archaic people. Um, you know, nonetheless, it looks like these ancient Beringian people uh, do c contribute some ancestry as well as the language to the speakers of the Algonquin. Algonquian languages, uh, which will feature prominently uh, in today's lecture on the Mississippians. Uh, so the Mississippi River, it's a very large river. It's by far the largest in North America. The basin, you know, that is the uh, area that water flows into, um, you know, the Mississippi is, uh, covers quite a bit, um, you know, of North America. Uh, so it's very, very important, um, you know, sea, tra sea trade, sea travel, especially for primitive peoples that, you know, don't have uh, roads, wheels, gasoline, is much, much cheaper than land travel and land trade. Uh, so controlling rivers, controlling uh, river basins, building settlements along these things, uh, it just makes a lot more sense than uh, developing inland trade routes. Um, you know, the mouth of the Mississippi, that's where you go and your ships can... Uh, you know, you could sail all the way from, you know, the upper Missouri River in uh, kind of the Great Plains region of the United States. And if you just follow the river, you could, you know, sail down the Missouri, down the Mississippi, and eventually end up in the Atlantic Ocean. And, uh, you know, from there, you could contact the Caribbean. You could sail around to the east coast of the United States. Um, you could sail down to Mexico, as some did. Uh, so it's all very, very important. And um, all of these peoples that lived along the Mississippi River, uh, the Mississippians would go and connect them and uh, greatly, greatly influenced all of them. Uh, some for better, some for worse. Um, so in the beginning, you know, we have what are hunter-gatherer tribes. They were very isolated, very fierce with each other. And, uh, you know, just kind of living hunter-gatherer existences, um, you know, very, you know, hard scrabble. Death rates, you know, probably a fifth to two-fifths of men in these societies would die in combat. Um, you know, they were definitely not fun um, times to live. The tribes were notoriously xenophobic. Um, you know, most of them had names, which translated literally mean the people, and their neighbors' names are enemies or mutes, you know, people who cannot speak our language. Uh, so they were definitely uh, very xenophobic um, and not nice to each other. Now, further south, you have the development of civilization in uh, Central America and what's called Mesoamerica. And uh, that's where you start to see um, kind of agriculture develop. Uh, you, you have corn, bean, and squash, which are kind of the big three crops in uh, North America and uh, Mesoamerica as well. And uh, these crops are actually introduced uh, to North America. And it's a little bit difficult. Um, you know, in Eurasia, as uh, Jura Diamond discusses in his excellent guns, germs, and steel, crops uh, would spread from, you know, by uh, latitude rather than uh, by longitude. So it's, um, 
if that makes any sense. So, uh, you know, if you have, you know, if you're growing a plant at a, uh, you know, a type of crop at a certain latitude, there's a good chance that it can grow at similar types of latitudes uh, since there's similar amounts of sunshine, um, you know, possibly similar climate as well. It's a lot harder when, you know, you're changing, um, you know, when you're going north or south, uh, which made kind of development of agriculture in the Americas uh, a lot more difficult. Um, so it took a lot longer for kind of this uh, crop package, you know, the Neolithic revolution, that's what it's called. You know, when you have this uh, spread of not just agriculture, but sedentary societies, trade, a political hierarchy, um, you know, it takes a lot longer for that stuff to spread in the uh, Americas, since it's more of a uh, north and south continental landmass uh, than it is in Eurasia, where it's more uh, east to west. Um, and you can just look at a map. I mean, it's uh, especially for like Mesoamerica, it's much uh, taller than it is wide. Um, so agriculture was uh, actually introduced, um, you know, in the Mobile Bay region of modern day Alabama and not the mouth of the Mississippi, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, there's actually some finds of barnacles, which are commonly found on the Gulf of Mexico coast, which are, uh, you know, found in some sites in the Mississippi River. So it looks like there actually were um, trade routes that connected, um, you know, parts of northeastern Mexico uh, with the, uh, you know, Mississippi River Basin. Uh, so these Amerindian tribes, um, you know, by the time the Mississippian uh, civilization developed, uh, you know, did have contacts uh, with Mesoamerica. These uh, societies were definitely not in isolation. Um, they were, uh, you know, did have contact with each other. And that's likely where the Mississippian uh, society actually developed from. Um, you know, the societies of kind of the modern day United States uh, were actually pretty primitive compared to the societies of uh, Mesoamerica. There had been uh, kind of abortive, um, you know, civilizations in the BC period, but uh, they ended up collapsing for unknown reasons. Um, and they were more kind of, uh, you know, dense hunting hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, they weren't really advanced uh, agricultural societies like in, they were in Mesoamerica. Um, so what happens is you have this contact, and it looks like it's actually specifically... So kind of the methods we're using for this, you know, what tools do we have? You know, for the Amerindian peoples, a lot of them were destroyed, their culturals you know, cultures obliterated, uh, their historical consciousness has largely faded out. Uh, so the tools we use to understand a lot of their history, we have archaeology, we can uh, dig up burial mounds, we can dig up uh, old sites from their cities, um, you know, just random finds of artifacts. Uh, we can also look at their languages, see how they interacted with each other, what sound changes they have, um, what uh, concepts they have vocabulary for. And we also have genetics. Now, unfortunately, as much as I wish we had genetics, a lot of the tribes in uh, the modern day United States are not cooperative with genetic testing, uh, usually for well-founded reasons. Um, so we do not have a lot of their DNA to uh, confirm a lot of the stuff. Thankfully, there is quite a bit we can do with linguistics and with archaeology. So uh, one thing that's actually very interesting, and uh, it's from an excellent book called Clues to Lower Mississippi Valley Histories, Language, Archaeology, and Ethnography, uh, actually talks about uh, how we can tell that the uh, kind of agriculture and civilization uh, for the Mississippians originated uh, not in North America, but in Mesoamerica. So there's a thing called a calc, and what a calc is, is it's a literal translation of a concept in a foreign language. Uh, so, for instance, in English, we have the concept of a flea market. Um, a flea market is literally a translation, um, you know, from a French phrase, marché aux pousses, a market with fleas. Um, you know, uh, so you can tell... Um, just by, even though there's no, you know, uh, 
direct adoption of words from French. You know, we can tell there was that French influence on the English language that we just literally translated in English. And these calques actually appear in the Amerindian societies too. Uh, one of the peoples associated with the uh, Mississippians, the uh, Choctaw and the Chickasaw, uh, they have phrases like a child of mortar for a pedestal and a mother of hand for a thumb. Uh, there's also words in uh, the At Atacapa, Chitimacha, and Natchez languages, um, which are house mouth. I mean, there's no reason to necessarily, that means door. Um, now, there's no reason for, you know, door to literally be translated in house mouth, you know, in all these different languages. So it's kind of evidence that they got this concept of a door uh, from another language. And as it turns out, the use of the uh, phrase house mouth for a door actually appears in the Mayan languages, you know, found in the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, there's not any finds of, you know, contact from the Yucatan Peninsula uh, with the Mississippians, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, however, there is evidence of contact in uh, northeastern Mexico. And as it turns out, there was actually a Mayan language called Huastec that is that was and is spoken in northeastern Mexico. Uh, so it looks like this uh, Huastec group that was kind of on the uh, Gulf of Mexico northeastern periphery of Mesoamerica uh, actually, you know, had a, uh, tra you know, had trade routes, uh, sent settlers, soldiers, uh, who knows. Um, but they did reach all the way to Mobile Bay in Alabama, and they did kind of uh, catalyze the development of this kind of Neolithic, um, you know, agricultural societies of the Mississippi River Basin. Um yeah, and there's some, um, let's see, yeah, and there's, a, there's more uh, evidence of contact beyond that. Uh, the Huastex, um, they did go and build kind of giant uh, earthen mounds uh, diff that, would, that were different from the architecture of kind of the, you know, more core Mesoamerica, you know, in the Valley of Mexico, and then further south in the Yucatan. And, um, you know, these mounds, you know, they do go and they're very, very similar to the large earthen mounds that we find in the Mississippian society. Uh, so these, uh, you know, kind of more advanced peoples, the uh, uh definitely um, did influence the uh, Mississippians quite considerably. Um, and the Huastecs, uh, even though their name does have Aztec in it, they are not related to the Aztecs at all. Uh, the Aztecs are Numic people. Um, or not a Numic people, they were uh, Udo, Udo-Aztecan people, distantly related uh, to the Comanche and to the uh, Ute of the modern-day southwestern United States. Uh, they're not related to, uh, you know, the Mayans at all. Um, so we have, you know, the spread of, uh, you know, this, and there's some other words too. Um, there's words for water, tooth, the number six, shell, the word for now, ocean, dog, uh, the word for back and uh, whip uh, that also look like they came from, uh, you know, Mesoamerica and that uh, Huastec society. Um, so, you know, a lot of kind of ocean, you know, sea vocabulary, which makes sense. Um, you know, if it, if it is a sea contact and it looks like it was, um, you know, that it makes sense that the vocabulary related to ocean and, uh, you know, shells and that kind of stuff, um, you know, even water is uh, related to Mesoamerican vocabulary. Um, so you have kind of this introduction, uh, kind of, you know, maybe the ninth or 10th millenniums AD, uh, where you have this contact from the Huastec people of Northeastern Mexico uh, with these uh, peoples in, um, you know, kind of the lower reaches of the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, you know, some kind of modern day uh, Louisiana, uh, Southern Alabama, um, you know, a lot of other stuff. So, um, you know, who were these people that they contacted? You know, we have, uh, there's actually several different language families that kind of inhabit or inhabited at the time of European contact, uh, the regions that were, you know, inhabited by the Mississippians where we find all their, uh, mounds. We have the, uh, Siouan speakers, the, uh, you know, who the Sioux of, uh, 
kind of the Great Plains are most famous. Uh, we have the Muskogeans, um, you know, who are more of a southeastern United States, like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, that kind of area. Uh, we have those speakers. Uh, we have the Algonquian speakers, uh, you know, who tend to be more up uh, kind of in the north, Canada, that whole area, um, even though they have, uh, you know, areas in, um, you know, the United States as well. Uh, they tend to, you know, they, a bunch of them were on the uh, East Coast, like the Powhatan, uh, the Narangaset, uh, the Massachusetts. Um, those were all Algonquian peoples, uh, you know, but the Miami, the Fox, and the Shawnee kind of lived in uh, Mississippi uh, River territory too. And then you have the uh, Iroquoian peoples, um, you know, the Iroquois, you know, like the Seneca, the Mohawk, um, all of those groups as well as the, uh, you know, their distant relatives, the Cherokee, you know, who, of course, were uh, much, much further south, um, you know, and kind of ranged into uh, the Mississippian territories. Uh, so this is another cool thing we can do with linguistics. Um, the Muskogeans were likely the original Mississippians. Um, so the Mississippians, they would have formed kind of a... Uh, cultural area. Not all of them would have necessarily been Muskogeans. Um, what would have happened is, uh, you know, by civilization, you know, you have people that would go and copy you. Um, you know, maybe you'd conquer a tribe and force them to be as slaves and teach them your ways. And then, uh, you know, they'd rise up and overthrow you, but then, you know, still keep your cultural traditions. Um, that's what it looks like um, the Mississippians were. They were Muskogean in the core and then had other groups on the periphery that eventually overran them during their collapse. Uh, so how can we tell this? Uh, so linguists can go back and they'll develop what are called proto-languages. They'll look at words that uh, different members of a language family share. They can get a rough idea on how long ago the languages split from each other. Uh, you know, and they use archaeology too, but they have some uh, linguistic um, you know, ways of calculating it as well. And, uh, you know, they look for uh, kind of concepts and vocabulary, vocabulary that they share uh, that you can use to tell when they split up. Uh, so the Muskogeans, it looks like they split up kind of at the end of the BC, beginning of the AD era. And they have words, uh, you know, for several different types of um, settlements. Like they have a word for a fortified town. They have a word for unfortified town. They have a word, um, you know, for like a village, um, you know, and then for like a tribal camp. Uh, so that's not the case for some of these groups. Like the Siouans, for instance, they have a word for like a camp and then a town. They don't really have any uh, words you know, they would go and kind of discuss larger settlements than, you know, just like a, a town. Um, so you can tell just from that, that the uh, Muskogeans, you know, they lived in a relatively advanced society, you know, that had different types and sizes of settlements. Uh, whereas the Siouans, you know, lived in a much simpler society uh, where they did not have, um, you know, that kind of, you know, they didn't, it was really just camps or small towns. They didn't have anything more complicated than that. Um, so uh, for the Siwins, um, you know, of course, they inhabit a lot of, uh, you know, the modern day Mississippian civilization, but it looks like they almost certainly came after the fall. Uh, there is evidence um, in the notable Mississippian site of Cahokia near modern day St. Louis. And uh, St. Louis and Cahokia, they were uh, very important sites. Uh, it's near the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. So you have, um, you know, all the trade coming down from uh, the northern part of the Mississippi, from, uh, you know, the Mississippians that, uh, you know, reached all the way up into Wisconsin, um, you know, as well as the uh, tribes that traded along the Missouri River, Co you know, Missouri River, and they would all kind of come and meet at Cahokia. So the people at Cahokia uh, were very, very wealthy, very, very powerful. Um, you know, it's very common for those kind of uh, sites built at confluences of rivers, uh, you know, like in Ukraine, you have um, Kiev is a very famous example. Um, you have uh, Nizhny Novgorod in Russia, 
uh, what these cities could do is they would go, they'd build a fortress, and they could force people, you know, the traders on the rivers to, uh, you know, come and stop, and they would force them to pay taxes because they had to pass through that confluence. Um, you know, and you could make a lot of money, make a lot of power. You could deny trade to people that you do not like. Uh, you could favor trade for people that you do like. Uh, so a very, very important site. Uh, there are evident, There is evidence uh, fairly, fairly early on, I believe as early as uh, 1200 AD, so a few hundred years um, after Cahokia was founded, of Siwan artifacts, you know, that kind of um, the savage nomadic peoples of the Great Plains, uh, you know, already being in Cahokia. Um, so it's possible that there were, you know, might have just been trade, maybe there were slaves, uh, or it's possible, of course, that the Siwans had uh, already overrun um, Cahokia and set themselves up as, you know, ruling class or just taken over the uh, area altogether. Um, so very interesting, hard to tell for a lot of the stuff. Uh, so one of the nice things about agriculture is it allows your society's population to grow massively. Uh, in a lot of areas, the amount of calories you can get from agriculture is about 20 times as high as what you can do with uh, pastoralism and even higher than that for hunting and gathering. So even though your people are more poorly fed, disease-ridden, shorter, um, probably dimmer as well, you know, more brittle bones than they would be in a hunter-gatherer society, it doesn't really matter if you can outnumber your enemies 20 to 1. Uh, you know, you can just overcome them with sheer numbers. And what it looks like is these Muskogean people, uh, these Muskogean speaking Mississippians, you know, kind of spread up uh, from the, uh, you know, mid to lower um, Mississippi. And they really spread uh, all along the Ohio River, uh, all the way up to um, Wisconsin, uh, and also to the uh, east as well, you know, into, uh, you know, Georgia, um, you know, and possibly Florida too. Um, so the agri, you know, it looks like the people closer to the mouth of the Mississippi, you know, the ones who might have originally adopted, you know, kind of the uh, Huastec, uh, you know, Mississippi and mound building agriculture, all of that, um, they do not seem to have expanded as much. Um, why that is hard to say. Um, it might have just been that the Muskogean peoples from kind of the middle of the Mississippi, uh, they were more exposed to savage tribes. And uh, one thing we kind of see across history is that the uh, strongest um, states are the ones that develop on what uh, Peter Tor Torchin calls uh, meta-ethnic frontiers. And that is when you have an extremely very, very different group that lives uh, right next to you. Uh, one of the most famous examples is China, you know, like the uh, Kin, I don't know how you pronounce it. I can't speak Chinese. Um, you know, they were the uh, power that succeeded you know, that ended up taking over China and unifying China. Um, you know, they were the ones in the West. You know, they had the most contact with the steppe tribes. You know, they had to be the most militaristic and uh, authoritarian. And eventually you've got a uh, Qin Shi Huang who goes and unites everything. Um, you know, similarly for, you know, Europe, you have the Russians that go, um, you know, they're the ones exposed to these nomadic steppe tribes and the Mongols. They have to, you know, kind of create the military and state apparatus to resist these tribes. Um, you know, for ancient Greece, it's the uh, Macedon, you know, Alexander and Philip II, you know, the people that are most exposed to these non-Greek peoples uh, to the north of them, who are a lot more barbarian. Uh, I think it was similar for the Muskogean peoples. I think they were, you know, up in contact with these kind of Siwans and other groups. And, uh, you know, they just had to be more militaristic. And, uh, you know, since they were more militaristic, they had higher state capacity and were able to uh, spread throughout, um, you know, the Mississippi River and, uh, you know, all the way into the American Southeast. Um, a lot of this is just... Um, my personal educated guesses. Um, the group that, the Mississippian group that lived on the uh, Ohio River, that's the uh, river that kind of separates Ohio from Kentucky, you know, uh, reaches all the way up into Pennsylvania. Um, they're actually very mysterious. They're called the Fort Ancient People. And uh, no one really knows that much about them. They were destroyed by uh, Algonquian speaking groups um, shortly before the arrival. I mean, I believe the French encountered them or encountered people who had encountered them 
but there's not really that much on them. Uh, one noticeable thing, it looks like they did speak a Siouan language, you know, kind of the barbarians of the Great Plains. Uh, however, their Siouan language, um, the way that the words were pronounced, uh, some of the phonemes they had, were not actually characteristic of Siouan languages. Uh, they had certain sounds which only appear in the Muskogean languages. Uh, so what I believe happened is you have, um, you know, an originally Muskogean speaking agricultural people that expands through the Ohio River Valley, um, you know, maybe in the 13 or 1400s. And uh, during, you know, kind of the climate induced collapse of the Mississippians in the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, you have these small groups of, you know, kind of Sioux and war bands that install themselves um, you know, as the rulers of these Mississippian tribes. Um, and that's what it looks like happened in a lot of places. Uh, I know we already talked about, you know, as early as 1200, you start seeing Siouan artifacts uh, within Mississippian sites as large as Cahokia. Um, you know, you also, you know, it looks like that was kind of early, though. There was some major flooding around that time. Um, it wasn't really until kind of the late 14th uh, through the 15th centuries that the Mississippians really started to enter kind of a terminal decline. Um, it was probably climate induced would be my guess. Um, you know, you have the uh, civilization of the American Southwest that collapses around the same time and is overrun by the savage, the savage Numic peoples. Uh, it's my belief that's what happened in, uh, for the Mississippians as well. Uh, you have this kind of climate change, there's more droughts and, um, with the droughts, the harvests aren't as good, the taxes don't come in, trade breaks down, the, uh, you know, lords and chieftains and all that, um, you know, they had fairly sized villages, some of them being thousands or tens of thousands of people, you know, and those would, uh, you know, rule over considerably more people, you know, who are living in rural settlements away from those, um, you know, main settlements, um, you know, you start to see a lot of fortification at that time. There are, uh, you know, a lot more palisades that are built. Um, you have kind of interior palisades as well, you know, kind of like fortified government homes. You know, that might have, whether is that was just an element of kind of redundant fortification, whether it was due to, you know, protecting the chieftain or lord uh, from social unrest, it's hard to say. Uh, but there was a lot more fortification, so they were worried about something. Uh, you do not go to all that effort to, uh, you know, build all those palisades and that sort of thing unless you're scared of something. Um, so there's definitely a lot of warfare going on in that period. And, uh, you know, you have kind of three main groups that I think benefited. You have the Siwans we've talked about uh, who came from the... Uh, you know, Great Plains, you have um, the Iroquois peoples who came from kind of the St. Lawrence River Basin area, um, you know, like the Cherokee being the most famous. And uh, you have the Algonquian peoples, um, you know, from Canada and from uh, kind of northeastern America. And, uh, you know, the Cherokee, you know, I believe they're uh, very similar. They are a uh, Iroquois people who, you know, kind of migrated and they took over a, uh, you know, Mississippian um, society. I believe they have memories actually of their ancestors building those giant mounds that are characteristic of the Mississippian civilization. Um, so my guess is that, you know, that they're right there. A lot of their ancestors did build those mounds. Uh, it's just their other ancestors were uh, militaristic migrants from the North that, uh, took over the area. Um, and I'm not aware of any kind of linguistic studies for the influence of the Muskogean languages uh, on Cherokee, uh, but just kind of in general, um, one thing that the excellent author, what's his name, David V. Kaufman, uh, who writes in his Clues to the Lower Mississippi Valley Histories, Language, Archaeology, and Ethnology, uh, he does go and discuss that there was a Sprackboond, a speech area, uh, within the Mississippian um, or within the areas that the Mississippians uh, influenced, uh, whether it was due to trade, um, you know, or just due to, uh, you know, all of these different tribes overrunning the Muskogean speakers in the 15th century. It's, uh, you know, I would imagine it's a mix of both, actually. Um, so you have kind of this fall in the 15th century. You have uh, populations uh, massively decline. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of these large sites that are abandoned. And uh, so by the time Hernando de Soto kind of explores the region in the 16th century, you know, he's very much visiting a fallen society. And, you know, nonetheless, he still comes across all these fortified villages. Um, you know, there's definitely chiefdoms. They have, uh, you know, warriors, hundreds of warriors. Um, you know, they control regions. And, uh, you know, I know Roden's been reading about this, uh, you know, in his excellent story of the Americas by uh, Baldwin, which I really want to get my hands on. Um so, uh, you know, they kind of come across this fallen society that, you know, nonetheless is still uh, very much above the kind of hunter-gatherer level. And uh, the worst thing DeSoto brings are his pigs. Uh, the Amerindian tribes, they, uh, you know, they spent a lot of time hunting waterfowl. I'm sure they had diseases of their own, uh, you know, just, you know, like bird flu pops up every decade or two in the world. Probably pretty similar for... Um, you know, the uh, Mississippian peoples and the post-Mississippian peoples as well. Uh, but pigs are just filthy. They carry all sorts of terrible diseases with them. And uh, these pigs, they went and got wild, um, you know, the ones that Soto brought with them. And, uh, you know, they just kind of live in the forests. They go and they just eat everything. Um, I mean, they still cause tremendous ecological damage to kind of the southern parts of the United States. And, uh, you know, the main thing is they spread this disease, though, and, you know, those, those villages, even if they were fallen, um, you know, by the time the next Europeans came through decades later, uh, they were in nowhere near as good a shape as they had been uh, when DeSoto came through. Uh, so after that, the Mississippians they had already been on decline, and it just did not get better for them. Um, so the kind of final, you know, a lot of these peoples, even the Muskogeans had kind of regressed from their Mississippian level. A lot of them went back to, you know, kind of a mix between hunting, gathering and farming. Um, you know, their populations were much, much lower. You had uh, these old tribal identities that collapsed and the survivors kind of merged together, you know, in a very chaotic process. And then, of course, the Europeans are introducing weapons uh, that enable them to kill each other much e more easily than they used to be able to. Um, so kind of the end of the Mississippians is the Natchez people. They were one of the uh, groups in the south, uh, not Muskogeans, um, you know, a different tribe that, you know, had remained independent all that time. And uh, they go and their enemies, the Choctaw, who the Choctaw are Muskogeans, um, you know, had a bit of rivalry going back for a very long time, presumably, although it's difficult to say. And the uh, Choctaw had actually found some French allies, and they went and uh, finally destroyed the um, grand village of the Natchez in uh, mo modern-day Natchez, Mississippi, in 1731. Uh, so that was the final end of the Mississippians. And... Um, that's everything. Do you guys have 